Gospel of Mark, chapter number 10. We're going to look at a very familiar story in the Scriptures. We begin reading in verse 17. The Bible says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Notice he didn't say he kept them. He observed them. Means that he tried to watch his life to keep them the best he could. He was aware of them. He knew about them. But he observed them. That's not the message. Just thought I'd let you have that. Hmm? Uh Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Isn't that just like the Lord? Hmm? Uh, he just held him and loved on him. Boy, I'm glad when he loves on us, aren't you? Amen. Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, Sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, and take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for your mercy and for your grace, for your peace, for your hope, for your promises. Lord, for the strength that you give and for being a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Lord, thank you for, Lord, not only being a friend, but being our best friend. Lord, thank you for loving on us, even on those days when we're unlovable. You still love on us. And Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Now help us from the Word of God tonight. Lord, help the um, precious things of God not to fall on deaf ears. But Lord, may we receive them with gladness. May we heed to them. May we not observe what you say. May we keep what you say. Now, Father, bless as only you can. We'll not fail to bless you for being so good to us. Have your will and way now. In Jesus' wonderful and holy name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from these verses. Can I say, I want you to notice the request in verse number 7. This fellow asked a very good question. He said, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Can I say the world would be a lot better off if people would ask that question, would it not? Matter of fact, most of the time when you try to talk to people about eternity, they'll tell you they're all right. They'll tell you that they've been baptized or that they're a church member or that they're a good moral person. Uh, they'll give you an endless uh, uh, amount of response as to why they should get to go to heaven. This young man, uh, 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 even though later we find he observed the commandments, uh, he was still concerned enough about his soul uh, that he came to Jesus uh, and asked him what he might uh, have to do to in inherit eternal life. Uh, now notice, uh, he had witnessed enough in Jesus' life to know that he was the master. Hmm? He'd seen miracles that nobody else could do. Uh, he'd heard teachings that nobody else could teach. Uh, he knew Jesus would have the answer uh, for what he was looking for. Uh, we see the request. Uh, now notice the reply. Look in verse 11. Not what the young man was looking for. Jesus replied, he said, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Hmm? He says, There's none good but one that is God. Now you and I know that Jesus was the God man. We know he was all God. 
Yet he wrapped himself in flesh. He was all man. But Jesus, not wanting uh, 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 to the attention to be on him in the fact of him being God, uh, uh, he didn't want uh, uh, the Jews any more upset with him than they already were. Uh, he pointed them to the rightful place. Uh, he said, don't call me good. Uh, there's only one good, and his, his name is God. Uh, 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 he's Jehovah God. He's the Father. Uh, he's the one that you need to call good. He's putting this young man, uh, 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 his uh, perspective correctly. Hmm? Can I say that a lot of times uh, we don't like it when uh, the Word of God corrects us, when it corrects our ideologies, when it even corrects our theology. Jesus' reply, he ignored what the young man asked. Because can I say, the young man couldn't have eternal life till he knew where to look to get eternal life. Mm? So we see the reply. We see the request. Now, notice as Jesus begins to remind him. Notice the reminding. Look at verse number 19. Jesus says, thou knowest. How did Jesus know what he knew? Because Jesus was God. Hmm? Uh, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Now the young man, we see, gives a response. Look what he says. And he answered and said unto him, Master, notice he didn't call him good master this time. He's starting to learn a little bit. Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Hmm. Now, can I say something? There is a profound truth revealed right here. The young man admits to being religious. And he's been religious from his youth. But yet religion doesn't satisfy. If religion satisfied, why did he come and ask the Lord what it took to have eternal life? Uh, can I say works will not satisfy you. All works will do is leave you empty. Works will give you self-justification, but it will not give you peace with God. Uh, we find the response. Uh, now notice the regarding of verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Now, again, the Lord already knows this young man. Matter of fact, the Lord knew this young man was going to come and ask him this question before the world was even framed. The Lord also knows how the young man's going to receive the message. So only the Lord would do this. The Lord loves on him. The Lord is about ready to tell him the most hurtful thing that this young man is going to ever hear. But before he tells him, he loves on him. My dear friends, isn't that like the Lord? Uh, isn't that just like... He'll reveal himself, and he'll love on us, and then he'll let us know sometimes some of the most difficult things we need to hear. Hmm? Can I say as a church, isn't that how we should be? When folks come, shouldn't we love on them when they come? Shouldn't we encourage them? Shouldn't we be good to them? And that is a testimony of our church, how warm and friendly we are when folks come. Because you all know the preacher's going to get up, and he's going to throw the hammer down. And these dear folks, when they come the first time, need to hear something sweet from you because they're not going to get it from me. You know that, huh? Hmm? That was a joke, Marcy. You're allowed to smile, huh? But shouldn't we love on people? Uh, shouldn't we be good to people? Because people have a false sense of what it takes to go to heaven anyway. And a lot of people don't like hearing they have to repent. They don't mind hearing you've got to come to church. They don't mind hearing you got to be a good person. They don't mind hearing you got to put money in the plate. But they really mind hearing, no, you've got to turn from who you are and turn to Jesus and repent of your sins. They don't like that so much, huh? We see that Jesus regards him. He loves on him. Now, notice the requirements that Jesus gives him. Look again in, in, in verse 21. Jesus beholded him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Everything you've done, you're still lacking. 
Can I say a lot of times we don't like to hear that we're lacking. We like to think we're doing pretty good. One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Oh, boy. What does Jesus give him? What is the requirements? Well, the first thing he tells him, he tells him one must turn from their ways. He says, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor. Hmm? You've got to turn from the ways that you've been living and go a different direction. Hmm? People don't like hearing that. They don't like hearing you've got to turn. Hmm? This young man obviously was very wealthy. And the Lord says, take all that and sell it. And give it to the poor. He said, you're going to have treasure in heaven. And then he gives him another requirement. He says, come and take up the cross. Mm. He tells him, you've got to accept me and what I'm going to do for you. And you've got to be willing to be like me. You've got to take up the cross. Is that not why Jesus came into this world was to take up the cross to do the will of the Father Amen. you and I in order to be saved we've got to turn from our ways and then accept the Lord take up the cross mm -hmm. we've got to be willing to turn our back on everything we've ever known and take on the life of a Christian Amen. take up the cross we've got to accept him in his ways but then he also gives him the requirement of this. He said, and follow me. We've got to trust the Lord. Mm -mm. He says, turn, take up your cross, accept, and trust me. Follow me. Mm -mm. That was the requirements. Young man want to know what it took to go to heaven? You've got to turn from your ways. You've got to take up the cross. You've got to accept me. And you've got to follow me. You've got to trust me. Hmm? Now notice the rejecting. Look at verse 22. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. The young man was sad because he didn't hear what he thought he would hear. The young man thought that he would hear, you've done good. Just give a little bit more money in the plate and everything will be all right. See, he was willing to give what he could afford to give. He wasn't willing to give what God wanted him to give. And he was sad. Now, can I say a lot of poor people don't mind hearing that they got to sell what they have because they don't have much to sell. They're all in. Matter of fact, if I was to announce tonight that the Lord had given me some new revelation that we're all supposed to sell everything we got and put it in a kitty and we'll all live off of that equally. Because that's what they did in, in Acts chapter number 2. Hmm? Can I say those that have little would say, yeah, preacher, let's go all in on that deal right there. But those that have houses and lands and got a, a pretty good stock portfolio and got a, a, a pretty good bank account, they'd say, that preacher's done lost his mind. Hmm? I've worked too hard for this, and I'm not going to live like other people chose to live. Hmm? Well, that's what this young man's doing. He's sad. He's rejecting what the Lord offered. Can I say, what does he reject? He rejects the pardon. From Jesus pardon from his sins hmm? matter of fact many people believe that the rich man in Luke 16 is this very man that dies and goes to hell hmm? can I say he rejected the pardon of Jesus he rejected the paths of Jesus he rejected the promise of Jesus eternal life all because of the love of money can I say Jesus would go on to teach that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven? Can I say it's not that rich men can't be saved? The problem is, is rich men think that they already have what it takes to be saved. They're trusting in their 
wealth rather than the wealth of God, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, in looking at these verses, it is commonly preached and commonly accepted and commonly believed and commonly so, this story relates to salvation. Can I say the rich young ruler allowed his possessions to rob him of a position in Christ. Now here's what I want to ponder tonight. How many of God's children are allowing possessions to rob them of their position with Christ? If you're saved, your position in Christ is secured. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. But a lot of people are allowing their possessions to rob them of their position with Christ. Your fellowship with Christ is not what it could be because you're allowing something else to take place of that. And with that thought, I want to preach tonight on possessions robbing you of your position. Possessions robbing you of position. Now, let me just kind of get into a little bit about what possessions are. They fall in three categories. There's the possessions of treasures. There are a lot of people that are more concerned with monetary things and gold and silver and, and, and they're more concerned about those things than they are about the Lord Jesus Christ and their relationship with Him. Now, again, there's no, no sin in having wealth. Can I say Job was the wealthiest man in the East? Can I say Abraham was wealthy? Can I say there's a lot of people in the Bible that were wealthy. Uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus was wealthy uh, before he surrendered it all uh, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and become the Apostle Paul. There's a lot of people in the Bible that were wealthy. It's not a sin to have money. It's a sin when money has you. The love of money is the root of all evil. Mm? Not having money, the love of money. And there are a lot of people that their possession of treasure keeps them from being where they should be with God. Now can I say there are some people that are providentially hindered and have to work when it's church time. They have no say in that. They have to work. There are others who sign up to work or choose to work so they can make more money and God will just have to understand. God does understand when you're providentially hindered. God does not understand uh, when uh, the love of treasure takes place of your love for Him. There's a difference. So treasure is a possession. Can I say? Time is a possession. We are all allotted the same amount of time every day. There are some that will choose their time uh, uh, wisely and choose their time to affect their, uh, their position with Christ, uh, there are others that choose their time that takes them away from their position with Christ. Hmm? Can I say that some people, all their time is geared toward entertainment and amusement? Now, don't get me wrong. Listen to me. Listen to me well. I understand this. We all need a release. You need a release. And sometimes uh, entertainment or sometimes amusement uh, or sometimes uh, a sporting event or, uh, uh, or a good gospel concert or something that will give you a release from the pressures of life, that's okay. But when your whole life is wrapped around amusement and entertainment, instead of your walk with God, you've got a problem. Can I say time can also be called time killers? There are some things that uh, we kill time that could be used for the honor and glory of God. Can I say Jesus said we're to work while it's day because the night time cometh when no man can work. We're only allotted so much time to work for Christ. Uh, we're only allotted so much time uh, uh, to work on our relationship with Christ. But if we spend that time idly, it affects us. And it robs us of our position with Christ. Hmm? Now, God understands that not all of our time is the same. 
back when I was in the corporate world, I would work, on average, Miss Annette will tell you, 75 to 80 hours a week, sometimes a little more than that, every week, day in, day out. At the same time, I was an assistant or associate pastor, for you few that are still here from Orchard Street, as associate pastor, uh, I was uh, responsible for help writing a Sunday school curriculum for everybody from the toddler class to the adult class so we'd all be learning the same uh, uh, theme of a lesson on our own levels at the same time each week so when we sat around the dinner table uh, we all could discuss what we learned in Sunday school we was all on the same page uh, I was also very involved in uh, uh, the outreach ministries uh, the visitation program was mine uh, I also had to get uh, 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 the messages and everything uh, 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 to the radio station because we had a radio station ministry we also had a TV ministry uh, and all that fell under the umbrella of things that I did as responsibility as being associate pastor at that local church. Now, I hear preachers all the time, Brother Brian, tell me, well, if I was full time and could study and read all the time, I'd know a whole lot more about the Bible. Hogwash. If you allot your time for your position with Christ and you lot your study time God understands if you're working 80 hours and you've got responsibilities and you've got limited amount of time to study God will dump more on you in your limited amount of time than somebody that spends all day reading some of the most powerful messages that I've ever preached the Lord gave me when I had limited amount of time to study anybody ever hear of Jesus as the veil took me eight weeks to get that message anybody ever hear of too much lamb anybody ever hear of what was rolled away with the stone anybody ever hear of the reality of hell all those messages God gave me when I had limited amount of time to study see our possessions of time Sometimes it's limited what we can give God, but when you give God all you can give God, guess what He does? He blesses you abundantly. Hmm? Sometimes we have a lot of time, and a lot of it falls idly. And one man used to say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Hmm? So time is a possession that you have. Treasure is a possession you have. And then a little category we'll just call toys is possession that you have. Some people have toys that have motors on the back and go on lakes. Some people have toys that have motors in the front that burn rubber and go fast. Some people have toys with two wheels. Some people have toys with three wheels. Some people have toys with four wheels. Some people have toys with six wheels. You can have toys with multiple wheels. Some people have toys with no wheels. Hmm? Some people have toys that go in their pocket or their purse. I hear the Apple I've, uh, Apple 14 come out today. Apple iPhone 14 come out today. There's probably people missing church tonight so they can get down there and get it today. Because Lord help if you have to wait till tomorrow. Because you need it you need it now. So you can get it updated so you can see how that new camera works so you can upload something to one of your social media accounts before anybody else. Hmm? Uh, we all have toys. Hmm. My grandbaby has seven more months to get here and she's got a whole basement full at my house. We have toys. Hmm? Hmm? I got bad news, little girl. You know how the foster family has loved you and we're good to you and all that, but you're taking a back seat when little Ella Rose gets here. You know that, don't you? You're not going to be sitting right here by Miss Sydney. You know that, don't you? All right. Just warning you. I'm just teasing. We'll still love you. Uh, we'll still make time for you. Mm. Just not as much time as Ella Rose is going to get. Anyway. Uh. But see, our possessions 
can rob us of our position with Christ. You know why we don't have re revival? Because Christ isn't the most important thing in our life. Mm. So how does possessions rob us of our position? What things do they affect that causes us our position with Christ? Can I say possessions rob us of our position? And I'm preaching to me as well as I'm preaching to you. Robs us of our position with Christ when they affect certain parts of our life. Can I say, first of all, when they affect our attention, then God doesn't have our attention. Hmm? Can I say that sometimes our possessions affect our attention even while we're sitting in the service? We're sitting here tonight. We come out to worship the Lord. If you're not careful, your possessions can affect how you worship. You may not believe this because I've watched it happen. While people are in the church house and their teams are playing, they're so concerned about the score, they're, text, they're checking scores while the, while the church is going on. Let me ask you, do you think that pleases God? Do you think that God doesn't notice that? Amen. Hmm? Oh, I guarantee you it does. And then people wonder why they're not blessed. They wonder why uh, uh, they have problems. They wonder why God doesn't answer their prayers. Uh, 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 wouldn't it be wonderful if every now you would speak with an audible voice and say, why don't you have your team answer your prayer? They're getting all your attention. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't care if that's popular or not. It's true. Mm -hmm. And if you don't amen, amen me, I'll sit down right there and amen myself. That's true. Uh, it affects our attention in the service. It, ex it affects our attention to the Scriptures. Mm, how many messages do we get upset at because it deals with one of our possessions? Our treasure or our time or our toys. I wish you could sit right here when I bring up Facebook. All of a sudden, Brother Brian, the attention span is gone. Hmm? Huh? You'd be amazed. All I got to do is bring up Facebook, and there's a certain element of the crowd, they think it's time to pray and go home because their heads go like this. They can't look up no more. Huh? I don't even know who has Facebook or who doesn't until I say Facebook, and then I can figure it out real quick. I'm either getting daggers stared at me or they're praying or fumbling around, you know, because uh, I've affected one of their possessions. Amen. And that possession is robbing them of their position with Christ. Right. And all I'm trying to do is help them. All I'm trying to do is give them the ble ble most blessed life they can ever have. Uh, can I tell you where it's at? Uh, it's in the arms of Jesus. Uh, it's in the will of Jesus. Because uh, there's coming a day, uh, uh, you're going to need Him on the scene. Uh, hey, you're going to have a youngin' that gets sick. Uh, you're going to have a, a job situation uh, or a money situation uh, or a health situation yourself. Uh, and Facebook isn't going to help you. Uh, but Jesus can. Uh, Amen. I preached a message a couple years ago at Thanksgiving. What if God blessed you with today with what you thanked Him for yesterday? Amen. So many of us were like that movie, Over the Hedge. Squirrel, we're gone. Our attention span it much anyway. Doesn't take much. The devil don't even have to mess with us anymore. He's put so many toys in our lives that it robs us of our attention, which robs us of our position with Christ. It's not only robs us of our attention in service or, or to the scriptures, but it also robs us of our attention to supplication. Most people don't pray more than five minutes a day. And when they do pray, their mind's on everything but Jesus. Amen. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. 
possessions rob us of our position with Christ when they affect our attention. Not only that. They also rob us of our position with Christ when they affect our attendance. Mm-hmm. Huh? Let me just ask you this question right now. How's your attendance chart in heaven looking? I know some of our Sunday school teachers keep attendance charts. Mm -mm. And I know it's a big thing for some of those kids when they get to put their sticker every week on the attendance chart. When they can look at the end of the quarter and see they, they, they didn't miss any weeks. Used to be a big deal when you didn't miss any attendance in school. Huh? I think my daughter-in-law was one of them. Huh? Yeah. Suck up. Huh? Let me just say, I never won the bike at the end of the year. It wasn't because I didn't like school. I loved school. I was good at school. I enjoyed school. I was an only child. That's the only time I got to be around people my age. I kind of enjoyed it. You know what I'm saying? But if my mother got wind that there was anything going on around the school, I didn't go. She held me out. She called me and said, tell me when the mumps aren't coming around anymore. Tell me when the measles aren't on the scene. Tell me when the headlights aren't on the scene. And on and on and on. Because I wasn't allowed to go to school if there was anything. Because, you know, that's the way my mother was. She was overprotective. Huh? What can I say? Listen. Our attendance for God's important. Hmm. When we show up, we need to show up wholeheartedly. But we are to show up. The Bible does say in Hebrews 10, 25, this is not a popular verse nowadays, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. Lord says there's some that aren't going to show up. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Him coming. Now, uh, can we all agree he's coming? And can we agree to this? His coming is closer than it's ever been before. So shouldn't we spend more time in church, not less? But there's some. Their attendance started in real good. It's robbing you of your position with Christ. Again, you may be struggling. You may be having problems. You may need uh, uh, some help from the Lord, uh, but you haven't showed up for Him. Why should He show up for you? You're in direct violation of the Word of God. For Him to know it to do good uh, uh, and do it to not, to Him it is sin. Uh, and can I say, He done told us not to forsake ourselves, uh, and yet you forsake yourself, uh, and you expect God to bless. He ain't going to do it till you get right with Him. And can I say getting right with God is more than saying, God, I'm sorry. It's God, I'm sorry, and let me show you works meet for repentance. I'm going to prove I'm sorry by changing. Hmm? Boy, it's popular tonight, but it's true. Hmm? Can I help you with something? I don't mean to be unkind. I don't mean to be ugly, but I'm already here. I can set my watch by who's going to text on Sunday and Wednesday that they're not coming to church. I've always got a good excuse. Hmm? But they're just not going to show up. Well, don't come whining when God don't show up for you. Hmm? There's some people I can set my watch by they're going to be here and be ready to worship. And there's some people, it just depends. Got a little cloudy weather. They're not coming. Or we get some nice weather. They're not coming. Uh, you know, I used to, I thought, boy, it'd be, it'd be a blessing if folks would let me know when they're not coming. Well, now I'd say, boy, it's a blessing if they'd quit letting me know they're not coming. Uh, again, if you're sick, we don't want you to come. We don't want you to spread it around. But there's even people take advantage of that. Well, Brother Doug, I, I've got a cough. It's not COVID. It's just a cough. But I don't want anybody to think 
that it's COVID. Well, I got news for you. They're not going to think if they come and they got their heart on Jesus, they're not thinking about you and your cough. That's your excuse to stay out. Hmm? Uh, I've known people that have come to church when they's half dead, but they wanted to come and worship. And by the way, when I come to worship, I don't care what you think of me or not. I come to see him. Hmm. Hmm. Boy, that went over well. I'm just telling you of your possessions, it's robbing you of your position with Christ. Say, Brother the Doug, I still pray. I still read my Bible. I still talk to God. Yeah, but is he really talking to you? Is he listening to you? Uh uh. Can I say? Your possessions rob you of your position with Christ when they affect your attitude. Can I say? It's hard having a good attitude when you've got to drive through Florence to get to church. I understand that. When you finally get here, you've got to deal with the stupid roundabout and somebody cutting you off there. Huh? I've been eat up so many, I mean close to just getting eat up in that roundabout so many times. Because I'm going to tell you something. When I hit it and it's my right of way, I don't slow down. You're going to hit me, you're paying the price. Hmm? And I promise you, Brother Clint, if they hit me, as many spine surgeries I've had, they're going to have to have an ambulance come. They're getting the jaws of life. They're cutting me out of that thing. I am not. I am not getting out of that on my own account. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to put two seat belts on, so they're going to have to cut both of them to get me out of there. And I'm telling you, uh, either their insurance or my insurance is writing me a big check. I promise you that. <laughs> you, you know, Bill Ingball said it. You can't fix stupid. Both lanes have a sign that says yield. You don't yield, you're paying a yield, trust me, huh? But listen, it's hard to come to church with a good attitude. I understand it. Uh, you're being horn cussed and people, you know, I don't know what it's been the last, anybody notice the last month, I guess people from Ohio are moving here because <laughs> people can't drive. I'm telling you. I mean, they pull out of a side street. I'm in the left lane. They just come right over in the left lane and hit their brakes. I'm thinking, what in the world? Don't you know I'm crazy? I don't slow down. And people just can't drive. And I know it's hard to keep a good attitude when people can't drive. And it's hard to keep a good attitude all the time. But can I say, your attitude will never be higher than your attitude. That's why we're to pray without ceasing. If you've got an attitude of prayer, guess what's going to happen? It's going to help your attitude. Uh, but listen, we've got to have a right attitude. Right attitude toward the Savior. We ought to have an attitude of thankfulness, an attitude of adoration. We ought to be so glad that Jesus cared for us. We've got to have a right attitude toward the saints of God. Hmm. Listen, I don't want to ever hear that somebody had a bad attitude towards you. You don't know what they've been through. They might have been out there on that roundabout going round and round, not figuring out how to get out of it, huh? So cut them a break. Got to have a good attitude towards the saints of God. But let me ask you a question. How well do you know your church family? We know their church family. Isn't that what we call ourselves? We don't call ourselves church strangers. We're church family. You know? As a matter of fact, I, I don't think I'm talking out of turn. I think I heard this. When Miss Kathy started coming, she couldn't understand how Miss Lisa knew all these people. Because where she used to go to church, you didn't get to know everybody. She said, you know, yeah, yeah, well, I go to church here. Yeah, I know. Huh? Huh? Am I telling that right? Yeah, I am. I'm telling that right. Huh? It speaks volumes to people when we know one another and we care about one another. How much do you know your church family? You know who's who? Now, I'm not saying you ought to be a busybody. Uh, you don't have to know everything about them. I don't know everything about everybody. I do that purposely. I'll never forget, I visited a church one time, just went to hear the preacher that was preaching. They was having a revival, and I knew the preacher. I went to go hear him. 
I just went in and sat down. I just sat down. I mean, I was just, that's what I did. Just went and sat. I went here preaching. And folks come up, shook my hand as a blessing. What a pastor come up. Man, I felt like one of them worms that gets dissected in science class by the time he got done talking to me. He wanted to know everything about me. I mean, he, he all but asked for my social security number. I'm not kidding you. He asked about everything. Want to know where I was from. Want to know who my p parents were. Uh, want to know where I worked. Want to know about everything. Uh, I found out as a preacher they want to know where I stood doctrinally on this and on that. And I'm like, hey, dude, I just come to hear some preaching. huh? Well, there's a reason that I... I'm very cautious about being that kind of person to other people. I didn't enjoy that. And I certainly don't want to put people in that kind of position. When visitors come, I make certain, I, I, I tell them they're well. I don't even tell them I'm the pastor. I think they figure it out eventually, but I don't, I don't tell them that. I just welcome them. And even those of you that have been here, unless you tell me where you work, most likely I don't know because I'm just not a busybody. I figure if it's that important for you to tell me where you work, then you'll tell me. Uh, or if it comes up in general conversation, I'll find out. But I, I'm just really, I want to be more interested in your spiritual needs uh, than to intimidate you trying to figure out everything about your physical needs. Are you listening? Right. And so it's very important. But do you, how much do you know about your church family? Hmm? Do you know? They all know you all know who they are. If in general conversation somebody says, hey, do you know Brother Ed at church? Well, you got a one in three shot. <laughs> we got Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Uh, I still had not figured out that deal right there. Because uh, it's really not popular to call him old Ed. But he's old Ed. Even though he looks older. Uh so, I mean, you know, he looks like Colonel Sanders some, so, but that ain't real nice, but I'm not really a nice person, but, but you ought to know who they are. You ought to know Ed Pierce and Ed Wilson. Ed Wilson's easy for me because I knew a preacher named Ed Wilson back in the day. But you ought to know who your church family is. So who's the third one? Well, Eddie Howe. He's only been here longer than any of us. Huh? But you ought to know that. You ought to know folks in the, in the church. If you don't know them, you ought to invite them out for an ice cream, Dairy Queen. Just sit down and talk to them a little bit. Uh, you'll have a good attitude towards them if you know about them. Mm. And we ought to have the right attitude towards sinners. Mm. Here's the right attitude towards sinners. Jesus loves them. And we love them. And we want to get them to Jesus. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. If they come for the right reason, we want them here. Now, if they come for the wrong reason, we'll find out what that is. And if it's uh, causing problems, then we don't want them here. But if, if it's not causing problems, we'll let them stick around. Mm, but you ought to have the right attitude towards sinners. Mm, but your possessions can affect your attitude. Because if you're not positioned right with Christ, your attitude will be wrong. It also can affect our affection. Hmm? I just wrote this down. I thought this was good. The Holy Ghost gave me this. I wrote this down. Your love and my love ought to mirror Jesus' love. He said that's how the world know you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. But our love ought to mirror his love. You know how he loved? Unconditionally. I love that old song, he looked beyond my faults and saw my need. And that's how our love ought to be. Because if you're looking for faults, you don't have to look for. We've all got them. Right. And, you know, you don't even need the devil to point out faults. We all have faults. But we ought to look beyond people's faults and see they have a soul and see that Jesus loves them in spite of them the way I love them too. Hmm? You say, and, and, and by the way, I don't want to hear that, well, I love you because I'm commanded to, but I don't like you. Well, how can you love somebody you don't like? Right. Now, you may not agree with them on everything, but you can still love them. 
No. My wife don't agree with me on a lot of things. Sometimes I say things from the pulpit and I'm dreading the ride home. Because she didn't agree with it. But she still loves me. So how you know she still puts up with me. She loves me, huh? But see, we gotta love people. We gotta love them to a fault. Right. Instead of loving them conditionally on their faults. Well, let me give you one more for y'all to pass out and die on me tonight. I'm talking about your possessions that rob you of your position with Christ. And they'll do that when they affect your adherence. It's a fancy word for obedience. If something in my life keeps me from being obedient to the Lord, I don't need it. No matter what it is. If it affects my obedience. Can I say? I'm talking about the my obedience to follow. Is that not what Jesus said? Take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say walk side by side with him. He certainly didn't say walk ahead of him. We get in big trouble when we walk ahead of him. He said follow me. Hmm? And he'll never lead you where he can't take care of you. Hmm? But we're to follow him. But if I'm not positioned properly with him, I'll get ahead of him. Hmm? We don't like to wait. We don't have patience. Don't pray for somebody to have patience because <laughs> through much tribulation work with patience. But can I say, when we're positioned right with him, we have no problem following him. But when we allow something to affect our position with him, we won't follow him. It affects our obedience. Can I say this? It affects our obedience to fight. We're in a warfare. Our warfare is not with flesh and blood. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. We're fighting a spiritual battle. And can I say, carnal weaponry does not work. Mm -mm. Threatenings does not work. The only thing that will work is the whole armor of God and the word of God. That's the only thing that will work in this thing. And my dear friends, if I'm not adhering to the things of God, I will not have on the proper armor and I will not use the word of God and I will get defeated in the fight every single time. Can I say, if your position with Christ isn't right, you won't even get in the fight. Hmm? Anybody ever seen that movie, The Replacement? If it's a football movie, chances are I've seen it. Well, football season's on us. So they're playing a lot of football movies, and I've seen Replacements 47 times, you know. It's just one of the movies that's on a lot. I tend to watch it a lot. No. But it was on again the other night. And uh, there's a scene after the first game. If you don't know the gist of the movie, all the football players go on strike, so the teams hire what they call scabs or replacement players to play, guys that would never have got a chance to play in the NFL uh, because they you know, had problems or weren't good enough or whatever. Now they're on the team. They're playing. They play the first game. They lose the game. They all show up to, to sulk in their loss, and all of a sudden the real players show up, and they begin to uh, cause a big scene and everything. A big fight breaks out. Well, the one guy, he hides behind the jukebox while all the other guys are fighting. huh? And all the other guys, you know, they all get thrown in jail all together, and all the other guys, they're, they're all licking their wounds and talking about wasn't it good to mess that guy up and do this and do that, what have you. I do not advocate violence, but it is a good thing to participate every now and then, okay? You know what I'm saying? You've been there, huh? But anyway, the one guy gets to popping off, and they call him out. They say, what are you talking You was in behind the jukebox. You didn't even get in the fight. And see, that's what happens a lot of times. There are some who are taking their position, they're making up the gap in the hedge and taking their position in the battle. They're praying, they're seeking the Lord, they're showing up, they're doing their part for the cause of Christ, and they're in the fight. A lot of them taking a lot of licks. And then somebody that doesn't show up half the time, got the wrong attitude, doesn't ever tie, doesn't ever pray, doesn't ever do anything, they want to take credit. When Jesus comes, the ones who are wearing the garments that have been soiled in the battlefield are the ones that are going to get the rewards. You do know that, don't you? Uh, the shiny guy with the helmet that's never been scratched on the sideline, he doesn't get the glory. 
Hmm. You've got to be in the fight. Hmm. And can I say, if you're not positioned right and you're not obedient to Christ, you won't be obedient in the fight. Matter of fact, when it gets on, you're going to be one of the first ones to head to the house. Let me give you a case in point. COVID. Can I say tonight there are Baptist churches all over the South sulking because they can't pay their bills, because they can't uh, 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 get people to come out or come back, and they're having all kinds of problems, and they're wondering why, why, why? Because they listen to the government instead of listening to God. Ran into a fellow pastor of a Baptist church just this week. Hadn't seen him. Asked how the church was doing. I said, God's been good in spite of the pastor. And I do mean that. And then he begins to tell me that they lost 100 people during COVID. Lost a lot and most are young people. Lost everything. Can't get them back. And they closed a lot during COVID. I said, well, God blessed us during COVID. We had five revival meetings break out. Had 17 young people say, God's been a blessing. God's still a blessing. God's been good to us. You see, when the fight got on, some chose to go to the house. And can I say there were even folks in our church that decided to go to the house. You know what I heard this week? Let me go talk to my buddy Thad. He'll like this. You know what I heard this week? The whole vaccine that everybody had to have, which you, now you've got to have your 14th booster. You know what I'm saying? And now they're, they're dying. Biden just spent, you know, four thousand billion dollars to Ukraine but now he can't fund COVID anymore uh, uh, but you know what I found out the whole testing process on the vaccine came down to they tested it on eight mice they have been jabbing people for three years with something that's supposed to cure supposed to be a vaccine by the way if you got a vaccine you don't need 14 of them I don't know what booster are we on now Everybody's scared to death. Well, winter's coming. I need another booster. Well, if you've got a vaccine, you don't need booster. Let, let me help you something. I had one measles vaccine when I was a kid. I haven't had to get one every three months. Right. Mm, I had one polio vaccine. I don't have to get one every three months. Amen. They're basing everything they got on jabbing eight mice. I'll just believe God. If God can't take care of me, I'm in trouble anyway. Right. Right. Now, you can get vaccines and all the vaccinations you want. Go help yourself. But don't tell me I have to have them. Right. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Uh, and can I just say this? I remember Biden explicitly saying, if you got the vaccine, you wouldn't get COVID. Right. And he had it twice in a week. Yeah. At least that's what he thinks. Who knows what he thinks? I mean, really. I'm just trying to help you. We need to be in the fight. Amen. COVID was just the first test before the Antichrist comes on the scene. They're going to test and test and test. And by the way, they didn't hire 87,000 uh, IRS agents because Miss Billy isn't doing her job. They're going after somebody, uh, and there's one uh, entity in the U.S. where they haven't been able to touch the money. Uh, that's through churches, uh, and you can bank her down. Obama tried to do it, uh, and he got caught. Uh, uh, those 87,000 people are not going after the rich. Uh, there's only 512 billionaires in the U.S. Uh, why do we need 87,000 to go after 500? They're going after churches. Uh, and what are you going to do uh, when the IRS uh, and federal... By the way, uh, they're equipping them with AR-15s. Why do IRS agents need a, a, an assault rifle, Billy? Do you have an assault rifle? Uh, you've been there for, uh, uh, for a couple years. Uh, you don't need an assault rifle. Uh, why are they got to have assault rifles? Because uh, they're going to be standing outside of churches uh, and demanding your uh, IRS a tax ID number uh, and they're going to ask you uh, how to pay back taxes uh, for years gone back uh, for what you've given to churches. Uh, they're coming after you and I. Uh, you might as well make it up tonight. Uh, are you in the fight or not? 
Hmm? I promise you they hate guys like me. Because I just read and see how stupid things are and I bring it out. Hmm? They don't want the truth to come out. Amen. Hmm? But you've got to make up your mind. But if you're not positioned with Christ, you'll not be in the fight. You'll be scared to death. Run. Oh, no, that's what the government says. Government never lied to us. How come they've never told us which one of them shot J JFK? Yeah. You do know our government was behind that, don't yes, you? Right. Oh, they hired the mafia to do it, but they were behind it. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if Johnson didn't buy the bullet. Why do you think he got killed in Texas? Guess who was from Texas? Anyway, it'll affect your obedience. Your obedience to follow, your obedience to fight, and your obedience to forward the gospel. It don't matter what the climate of the world is. Jesus left us one job to do, and that's to get the gospel out. But if you're not positioned with Christ, you won't care about getting the gospel out. Amen. You won't show up on Monday nights to pass them out tracts. You won't support missions out of your personal income. You won't be involved at all because you're not where you should be. Amen. Churches have laid down and allowed the devil to take over because churches and God's people became prosperous and our possessions have robbed us of our position and some of the most weak minded and wishy washy people that I've ever met are not Democrats they're Christians God will understand you know what God understands what he gave us to understand But yet, while we're here, we let all of our possessions even affect us while we sit here. Hmm. God help us to not go away sad and grieved tonight because we have many possessions. But go away and say, Lord, what's mine is thine. Lord, it all came from you anyway. And Lord, if there's anything I've got you can use for your glory, I'll gladly give it. Just let me know what it is. But Lord, I want to make certain that I'm right where you want me to be with you. Nothing else matters. And when that's our attitude, and when that's our lifestyle, there is nothing the world can throw at us that will change us. Study church history. Study the martyrs. They didn't have much of this earth goods, but they had a whole lot of God. And even when they went to the chopping block, they went with peace in their soul. And can I say, when the church became prosperous, we traded away our relationship with God. And that's why churches can't have revival, why Christians are so anemic, why so many people have to take medicine to go to sleep at night, take medicine to get up in the day, take medicine to get through the day, why people can't deal with reality and can't deal with life, it's because your position with Christ has been affected. When Jesus becomes your all in all, there's nothing this world can do to stop you. God help us to make certain our possessions don't possess us. But Jesus does. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Well, he's picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We do thank you for those things you provided in our lives. A lot of them are for our enjoyment. But Lord, they're all for you to get glory for. And God, I certainly pray that we wouldn't allow our possessions to possess us. But, Lord, we would certainly allow you to have first place in our heart and our life. Help our position with you to be undaunted by anything in this world or anything thrown at us by the world. I pray you'd be glorified and magnified in our lives. pray you'd be high and lifted up. And I pray that, God, folks would see you in us. Lord, forgive us of our 
short-sightedness and forgive us of being so anemic. God, we got revival coming up. Just a few weeks, I pray, Lord, we'd be on fire for you long before the meeting starts. I pray we'd see you truly send revival to this part of the country. This little church of folks sold out for the honor and glory of God. Now bless folks. Help them, Lord, to not allow anything to affect their position with you. Speak to hearts now in this invitation. God, we certainly pray for somebody here tonight unsaved. You'd reveal it to them. That God, we might see him saved. God, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.